Welcome back. I'm the Intense MD, a double board certified intensivist, here to give you an inside look into the intensive care unit. Today, we're talking about strokes. I've already made a video about TIAs or mini strokes, but I figured I'd give an overview about strokes in general. Today, we're gonna to talk about what a stroke is, what are the risk factors for a stroke, how you can identify if you or somebody else is having a stroke and how strokes are treated. What is a stroke? A stroke is when blood flow to the brain is disrupted. This is a serious medical condition. It can occur when a blood clot or something else may block a vessel and cause disruption in blood flow or if a blood vessel ruptures and bleeds. There are two types of strokes. The first is an ischemic stroke. This is the most common type of stroke. About 87% of stroke patients have an ischemic stroke, and that is the type that is caused by a blockage. The second type is a hemorrhagic stroke. This is about 13% of all stroke patients, and that is the bleeding type of stroke. That is when there is a, an acute bleed in the brain. Both of these types of strokes are very serious, and they need immediate medical attention. Ischemic strokes can be caused by several different things. One is atherosclerosis or atherosclerotic disease. This is when plaques are formed in the blood vessels and cause narrowing in the blood vessels. The next can be an embolic stroke. This is when a blood clot or piece of plaque or sometimes even piece of tumor breaks off in the bloodstream, travels up to the brain and blocks the blood vessel. There is something called a cardioembolic stroke. This is when an abnormal heart rhythm can cause a clot to form that then travels to the brain. Small vessel disease can cause strokes, and this is when the smaller blood vessels in the brain can be inflamed and then become blocked. This is common in disease processes such as diabetes or hypertension. Vasculitis or vasculopathies is when there is inflammation in the blood vessel. A lot of times this is caused by an autoimmune process or when the immune system is attacking itself. This can also lead to an ischemic stroke. What causes a hemorrhagic stroke? Again, this is the bleeding type of stroke. One of the most common causes is high blood pressure, hypertension, sometimes even caused by certain types of drugs that can drive your blood pressure up. Next is an aneurysm. This is an outpouching of the blood vessel, which can make it weaker because it thins the wall at that area and it is at risk for rupture and bleeding. Coagulopathy or the blood being thin can also increase the risk of bleeding in the head. This can be caused by many things. Sometimes people are on blood thinners or if somebody has cancer or liver disease or anything that can make the platelet count drop, this can increase the risk of bleeding in the brain. There is also a condition called AVM or arterial venous malformations. This is a congenital disorder where there are abnormalities in the blood vessels in the brain and these areas are more likely to bleed. Just as a side note, AVMs can occur anywhere throughout the body. Sometimes they occur in the GI tract as well and this can increase GI bleeding. So this is not isolated to the brain. And finally, of course, trauma. Anytime somebody is hit in the head, they can have a hemorrhage. And again, going back to people who have thin blood, if they have a traumatic head injury, they are more likely to have a hemorrhagic stroke or any type of brain bleed. So these were some of the risks for ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke. Of course, there are other factors that can contribute, such as age, different health conditions, family history, but in general, these are some risk factors for stroke. What does having a stroke look like? It can look different in different people. The severity of the stroke and the symptoms depend on the location of the brain that is being affected by the stroke. One of the most common symptoms with stroke is weakness on one side of the body. Suddenly someone might not be able to use their arm. They might lose balance because they are unable to use their leg. You can also have difficulty speaking, a facial droop, slurred speech, dizziness, 
numbness on one side of the body. I've recently had a patient who came in for a stroke and their only symptom was numbness in their mouth that would not go away. Can also have blurry vision, double vision, tunnel vision, any changes in vision are a sign of concern. There are some mnemonics that help people remember the most common symptoms for stroke. So when they see it, they'll know quickly to identify it and be able to call for medical help. One of the most common ones is be fast. B is for balance. E is for eyes. Like I said, they can have blurry vision, double vision, tunnel vision, or loss of vision in any area of their visual field. F is for face, facial droop. A is for arms. Like I said, someone can suddenly lose function of one of their arms. S is for speech. And T is for time. So that is to remind you that timing is crucial. Every minute counts when we are dealing with a stroke patient. The quicker it is treated, the more likely this person is to regain function. So if you have any concern that somebody with you or you yourself are having a stroke, it is important that you call 911 or whatever the emergency medical number is in your country to get medical attention as soon as possible because time is brain tissue, so every minute counts. The effects of a stroke can be devastating, so that is why we emphasize that time is of the essence when we are dealing with a stroke patient. Once you arrive to the hospital, most likely the team will call a stroke alert. Many things happen in a short period of time with a stroke alert. The patient is assessed with something called the NIH stroke scale. The NIH stroke scale is used to determine the severity of symptoms, and I will pop up on the screen just an overview of what we look out for. A neurologist is consulted and sees the patient emergently to do their assessment, and the patient is taken to the CAT scan to get a CAT scan of their head. The importance of the CAT scan of the head, it may not necessarily show an ischemic stroke, but it looks for any sign of bleeding for a hemorrhagic stroke. This is important because one of the medications we use for an ischemic stroke is called TPA. This is a clot busting agent. It is a very strong clot buster that thins the blood. So if somebody has a bleeding in the brain, this would be catastrophic to give this to a patient. So we need to rule out hemorrhage as the cause of any neuro deficits first before we proceed with giving this medication. This medication is a time sensitive medication. It is recommended to be given within three hours of symptom onset. So if you are concerned you're having a stroke, do not wait to see if your symptoms get better because you may come to the hospital and be outside of the window to receive this medication that can make a big difference in how much function is regained. Of course, I said there are some contraindications to this medicine because the biggest side effect is bleeding. So we are very careful about which patients receive this medicine. There is a questionnaire checklist that most of us go through to see if the patient had any recent surgeries, any prior brain bleeds, or any other reason why they cannot receive this medication. Another Imaging study that we look at is an angiogram. This is when we shoot dye through the blood vessels in the brain and the neck to look for a large vessel blockage. Like I said, there are many vessels in the brain. There are small and large vessels. If a large vessel is blocked and causing a major stroke, the patient may be a candidate for an embolectomy. This is a procedure where a neurosurgeon will go in in a minimally invasive fashion. So this usually, they go in through the groin and they go all the way up to the brain through the blood vessel and retrieve the clot. This is to free up the blockage and increase and restore blood flow back into the brain. Again, this is another time-sensitive procedure. 
Ideally, this procedure should take place within six hours of symptom onset, but the window can be extended up to 24 hours in certain cases. If the patient is having a hemorrhagic stroke, again, this is the bleeding type of stroke, the treatment is obviously very different. We reverse any type of coagulopathy. So if somebody was taking a blood thinner, such as a Pixaban, Rivaroxaban, Warfarin, there are agents that we can give to try to reverse these agents, as well as some blood clotting factors to prevent further bleeding. In this instance, the CTA, CT angiogram of the head will be done to look for an aneurysm. If the patient has an aneurysm that is bleeding, there are two procedures that can be done for aneurysm repair. One is coiling. This is a minimally invasive procedure, very similar to the embolectomy where it's done minimally invasive and it's done through the blood vessel, but a coil is placed in the position of the aneurysm to prevent further bleeding. There's also surgical procedure with aneurysmal clipping. This is when there are clips placed in the area of the aneurysm. In the setting of a large stroke, this can be done more commonly in hemorrhagic strokes, but I have seen it done in ischemic strokes as well. The brain becomes very inflamed and begins to swell. And if you think about the skull, it is a finite compartment. It, does, it is fixed, it is hard bone. If there's swelling inside it, the bone does not expand, just the brain expands. So this can become a life-threatening situation because when the brain swells a lot, there is no other way for it to go than push it over on top of itself or down on top of the brainstem that can lead to brain death. In order to prevent this from happening, part of the skull may be removed temporarily for the brain to continue to swell in a procedure called a decompressive craniotomy. Like I said, a portion of the bone is removed and it is replaced at a later date. Sometimes the bone is stored within the patient. A lot of times it'll be in the abdomen, but there are many facilities, including my own, that will store in the freezer. So the treatment of a stroke very much depends on what type of stroke the patient had, the severity of the stroke, the location of the stroke, and how long between symptoms beginning and patient presenting to the hospital has elapsed. The goal of all these treatments is to minimize further damage to the brain and help the patient recover as much function as possible. In general, stroke patients are observed at least for 24 hours after their stroke in the intensive care unit, especially if they received TPA or had another procedure done like an embolectomy. Patients who have had aneurysmal repairs may need to be in the ICU for up to two to three weeks to monitor for cerebral vasospasm and other complications. If you had a stroke, you most likely spent some time in the intensive care unit. Some other parts of taking care of a stroke patient is performing a workup to determine what the cause of the stroke was. So we will look at an echocardiogram to see if there are any abnormalities in the heart that may increase chance of stroke, looking at an EKG or telemetry to see if there are any cardiac arrhythmias, look at carotid dopplers or the CT of the neck to see if there is any atherosclerotic disease in the carotids, and looking at some blood work to determine if the patient might have undiagnosed high cholesterol, or diabetes, and of course, checking their vital signs and seeing if they have poorly controlled high blood pressure. Also, 24 hours after the stroke and intervention, usually an MRI is done. This shows more detail of the brain, and this is better at showing what the tissue looks like, particularly ischemic stroke, to see how much has been affected because an ischemic stroke may not show up on CAT scan or CT scan for several days. Stroke patients need aggressive inpatient rehab. As soon as they're able to in the hospital, we have physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech language pathology seeing these patients to start rehabbing them so they can regain as much function as possible. So all of that is to say if somebody you know or if you are having stroke symptoms, this is a time-sensitive medical event, and it is very important that you call the emergent line in your country, such as 911, for help, or emergently get that person to the hospital.
There are treatments available for stroke patients. There is a lot of rehabilitation support and therapies available to help recover. So this is something that is very important and time sensitive. This is something that needs immediate medical attention. If you have any questions about stroke or if you need any clarification in anything that I've mentioned in this video, please leave your comments below. You can also follow me over on Instagram at the intense MD. My DMs are open and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you for watching my video and please subscribe to my channel if you want to keep up to date on any health information.